But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So we want to look in this sec session on the topic of servant leadership. Servant leadership. Does anyone not have a copy of the notes yet? Raise your hands, please. Okay. They will, if you keep your hand up, it will get to you eventually, we trust, okay? Servant leadership. And we want to look at how we can fulfill this teaching of the Lord and follow in His own example of being servant leaders. Because a leader can only be as great a leader as he follows, as he serves. And we'll look if you've got your notes. If not, keep your hands raised. A little exercise, but, you know, the little bird that keeps its mouth open and squawks gets the worm, so. <laughs> Just squawk a little, okay? Number one, we want to look in our notes. Help develop your followers to their full potential. That is an important key to servant leadership and to building a great ministry, a great church. Help develop your followers to their full potential. And let's see this from Ephesians chapter 4, the teaching of the Apostle Paul. When he started out in verse 11 talking about the fivefold ministry that Christ gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man or a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying or the building up of itself in love here the apostle continually repeats every joint every member every christian has an important part to play in building up the body of christ and if we try to be a superman or superwoman ministry or a one-man band where we do everything, you might be successful in doing it if you lead a small group of 10 or pastor a group of 30. But by the time that your church starts to grow, if you aren't training other leaders, if you aren't getting more people to be part of a team, leading and strengthening and building up the Christians, by the time your church gets to be a hundred, if, if it gets that far with only you serving, you're going to become an exhausted super pastor. By the time it's 150, you might be a dead super pastor, okay, of exhaustion and heart attack. And so we need to be very careful that we try to empower and train as many as we can to start to gain the skills and talents through which they can share in the ministry. It's every member that can contribute. And if we have members that aren't contributing, what would happen if we have parts of the body that don't do anything? You have a left hand that never does anything. Muscles are growing, going to wither up and maybe become paralyzed. If you have a stomach that doesn't do anything, well, the rest of your body is going to know it pretty soon, right? But we need every member of the body of Christ learning to become equipped to do what God has called them to so that we will have the full strength 
of every member, of every person on the team God wants you to build, that you're going to go forward with full strength to develop a church that will keep growing greater and greater and greater if we're developing and multiplying our ministry. Now, all through the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, we have emphasized again and again that a person's inheritance or the fruit of what they accomplish in their life, it often would come through not just what they accomplish in their life, but what were the results and the fruit of their children and their descendants. It was such a custom in Israel that a father would be honored by what his son accomplished that the Lord even said to Solomon, I'm going to judge you for your sin, but I won't split the kingdom in your day so his father would not be dishonored. No, I'll split it in the days of your son because that would be to the shame of Solomon. And so we are honored or potentially shamed by what our followers do with what we have given them. But if we multiply within them and start to train them, it's slower to train someone else to do something than do it yourself. If you're skilled, get it done fast. Okay, it's done right. But if you have to do it all the time, you won't be able to grow to other tasks also. You slowly get someone trained, and as they're getting good, you don't have that headache anymore. You don't have that responsibility. You can step up to new things, to more responsibility or greater ministries. Now, we have the example in the Old Testament of the father of our faith, Abraham. The Lord spoke to him and said, uh, To you and your descendants, I am giving the land. Look to the north, south, east, and west. It's all yours. But in his lifetime, how much of the promised land did Abraham own? The only thing he owned was a burial cave, a cemetery. God said, it's all yours. And he only gets a cemetery? That would seem like, you know, he really fell short. But no, he's the honored father of our faith that we're to walk in this stuff. So it was through his descendants. He trained them. He taught them how to follow the Lord after him. Abraham passed the baton to Isaac, to Jacob. It was multiplied to the 12 sons, multiplied to become 12 tribes. And the work of God prospered in their hand. But we have to spend the time and effort of training the next generation, whether our natural children or our spiritual children, our disciples, those that follow us, that they will multiply the work of God. Now we have in 2 Timothy chapter 2, this same truth showed us from a New Testament perspective through the Apostle Paul. And in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, he said to one of his spiritual sons, Timothy, The things you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men also, who will in turn teach others. So Paul here was the father of of this line of trained servants of the Lord. And he said to his uh, son, Timothy, you find faithful men that you can train that would become the grandsons of Paul. But then he said to these faithful men Timothy trained, they should learn to teach others. That would be the great grandsons or the fourth spiritual generation after Paul. And if somebody in the natural has 12 children, and each of them has 12 children, and each of them is 12 children. By the fourth generation, you've got millions. If we can disciple and train and send people forward in God, it doesn't mean you have to have exactly 12. Whatever God gives you, we don't make a ritual of it or a program, but we make it a vision to fulfill, multiply into the coming generations, both natural and spiritual. Now, some leaders don't do a good job at this. They will train people up to a certain point, and then when followers are, uh, are getting successful and maybe even praised, and maybe in some areas they're developing even beyond our gifts and callings, what do we do? Do we get jealous? I had two very talented children, natural children, 
the, uh, my eldest became more talented than me on music when she was eight years old. And I'd been doing it for 40 years. And, you know, and just, boom, there she goes out into the sky. Do I get jealous and say, no, I'm not buying you piano lessons anymore? No. It's to the joy of a parent to see the children excel. And it should be the joy of a pastor and a Christian leader, a, a cell group leader, if we train people and, and they can take the baton and run even farther than us. We have the sad example in the Old Testament of King Saul, who was not properly following the Lord, and so he could not properly train the next generation. His son Jonathan got a great start, but a sad ending, dying in a battle with his father when Israel was defeated. But, uh, but Saul wasn't able to take those that were rising up under him. He even tried to kill his son once. He couldn't take those rising up under him to a certain level. When David volunteered to kill Goliath and convinced him, well, I've killed the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will, will be dead like them, then he saw the faith of David. He, he released David to fight, but after David had defeated the giant Goliath, and they were going back through the cities of Israel and were getting the, uh, the praise of the women uh, singing songs to the conquerors that had returned from the battlefield, we can read in 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel 18, starting in verse 7, the, as they, the women came out of the cities, to meet the king and the soldiers returning and they sang and danced and said Saul is slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands okay and Saul was very angry it says this thing displeased him and he said they said about David he's killed ten thousands and me they've only said I only killed thousands what more can David have than the kingdom he's gonna try to steal the kingdom from me He's got more praise than me. He's got more anointing. Well, if we ever find our anointing decreasing and someone else rising up higher, then maybe we need to repent. <laughs> so we go on in God, okay? <laughs> but if they're going on, great. Let them run as far as they can go. Instead, it says that in verse 9, Saul jealously eyed David from that day forward. And the next day, when the evil spirit came upon Saul, uh, that David was playing music with his hand, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear and said, I'll pin David to the wall. And David escaped from his presence twice. Twice. Here's, you know, the musician calming the troubled king, the giant killer. But he's stepping up too high. He's got too much praise. And instead of Saul releasing him to greater things, Saul tried to start killing him and throw spears. And there are times when leaders find that young ones are stepping up and growing quick. And sometimes they say, hmm, the people like him more than me now. What more will he have than the kingdom? And start to get jealous and say, I know you think you're so anointed and you think you're better than me, but I know in your heart you're a rubble throw spears you know and these things happen in churches don't raise your hand in mine okay <laughs> no. but these things happen in the Old Testament and still sadly among the people of God but we have the New Testament example of a man that was very different than Saul and that was Barnabas Barnabas you study in the book of Acts when you first read about him in Acts 4 his original name from birth was Joseph but he was renamed, nicknamed Barnabas by the apostles, which means son of encouragement. He was a great encourager. And when Saul had gotten saved and came back to Jerusalem and wanted to join the Christians, they said, no way. You're going to sneak in and, and find out where we meet and you're going to arrest us all again. Pretty tricky there. Okay, the Christians wouldn't let Saul of Tarsus, the future Paul, join them. But Barnabas heard him out. Barnabas believed it. Barnabas got him joined in with the church. And years later, when Barnabas became the pastor of a revival and he needed help in the ministry, he went out and found Saul and invited him to be his assistant. 
Then years later, when they were in a missions team and they went out together, Barnabas and Saul, when Saul came to full maturity and anointing and was renamed Paul in Acts 13, Barnabas stepped down. Okay, Saul, you be the leader of the team now. And how many pastors will say, well, you know, my assistant's learning. Why don't you be the pastor for a half year? And, you know, see, how, see if you do well, you know. Maybe I'll give you the church or, or you'll go pioneer. You need some more training. Let's see how you do. Barnabas was a great man to encourage people to step up and even become greater than him. Paul and John Mark, another of his disciples that became the author of the book of Mark. So we want to be those that can train people and lift them up and encourage them and not just push them and drive them, but encourage them and be patient. Just as if you have a child, slowly, year by year, they grow, they learn, and they can become of significant maturity and skills. So we need that patience that we can all become spiritual fathers and mothers. Now, along with, in general, encouraging others, it's also important that everyone understands that we should especially be encouraging the sisters in the church to arise to full potential because, be honest, count the members of your church. Do you have more men or women? Amen. Okay. And some of you will say, two-thirds are women. And some will say, that long, you know, la la ki la. Okay? So, we want to value and appreciate the sisters, the women in our churches because they can be the greatest strength that your church could ever prepare for ministry. Now, some people wrongly interpret the Bible, you know, women should, you know, be quiet and stay at home and have lots of kids and don't do anything in the church, you know, and they're really misinterpreting the scriptures. We have the example of the Apostle Paul, that he was always an encourager of the sisters in the church. And if, just as one example, we look at the end of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16. As he's greeting the saints and giving directions, in verse 1 he said to the Romans, I commend you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant or a deaconess of the church in Centria. That word from the Greek is a deaconess. Now, some people don't believe in women deacons, so translations often only make it servant. But in other scriptures, it's translated deaconess. And Paul clearly is saying she is a deaconess of the church in centuries. She was a servant of the Lord. Uh, and, and he said, verse 2, she has been a helper of me and many others. And then he said, verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila my fellow workers in Christ. Now, we're first introduced to this husband and wife team, Aquila and Priscilla, in the book of Acts, where when you introduce the couple, the man, Aquila, was mentioned first. But a number of times in the New Testament, when it's talking about ministry, it instead introduces them as Priscilla, the woman, and Aquila, the husband. Probably because Priscilla had the dominant, stronger ministry. Or else Paul wouldn't have introduced them in ministry as Priscilla and Aquila. Okay? But it says that they had valuable ministry and, Paul said, greet the church in their house. Old New Testament churches were started out in houses and as they had a church in their house there and later repeated that they had a house church written in Corinthians, uh, years before, they had house churches in their churches, in their house, wherever they went. They lived in several different places in the New Testament time. But they always had a church because they were Christian leaders, and not just Aquila, the husband, but here, Priscilla, they have a church. So we have Pastora, Priscilla, and second in the list, Pastor Aquila. Okay? And then we have, in verse 6, Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Verse 7, Greet Adonicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen and prisoners, who are of note among the apostles. Now, 
Probably, this was again another husband and wife team. In most translations, it's a man and a woman, male and female, spoken of as a couple. But it calls them apostles. And some churches say that would be heretical to say you could have a lady in the ministry team with her husband of being apostles. So some translations actually change it back to two men, okay? <laughs> or say, well, it was probably a man and a wife, but the wife, she wasn't really, you know. We change things according to how we want our doctrines to be. But there's clearly women deaconesses, women pastoras, other uh, scriptures clearly tell us about women prophetesses, uh, women teachers, and here we have the suggestion even of a woman, a husband and wife, apostolic team. So we should, as much as possible, get the sisters involved in ministry. The largest church in the world, Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea, the pastor attributes the great success he had in raising up the church to 800,000 members because they focused on training the sisters, the ladies in the church, to become this, most of the cell group leaders or the Bible study leaders. And he said, the women are generally better communicators. How often do you hear the ladies talk, 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 talk. And what are the guys doing? <laughs> you know, we're just kind of there in neutral. No, ladies talk a lot more. They're excellent communicators. Get them learning the Word of God, and they will communicate the Word of God. Amen. Brothers, don't let them take your crown, okay? But, <laughs> but in the largest church in the world, 90% of the Bible study leaders, 45,000 of the cell group leaders in the world's largest church are women. 45,000 women, 5,000 men. Okay? <laughs> So we need to realize the value, the potential of training and raising up the sisters. If you don't understand all of what the scriptures mean about, you know, women in ministry or let the women keep silent, then come to our library and, you know, read a couple of good books that help explain it or come to classes or something, okay, to learn how to develop all of your potential uh, uh, people to ministry, the sisters and the brothers. So, number one, develop your followers to their full potential and you will see the work of God multiplying and strong by whatever member supplies. Number two, let your leadership be people-oriented, not task-oriented. Some people are focused on a goal, on a job, and they run over the people that should be joyfully helping them to obtain that goal or that success. But in the notes, ministry is all about loving God and people. Our Lord Jesus said the great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, and love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the goal that we have. But there are many in ministry that are not focused on loving and building up the people. They've got goals that they want to be, you know, the fastest growing church in Tai Tai. Or I've got, you know, my church, the church giving is increasing faster than any other church in the area. Or our youth group is the biggest around. And if we can have statistics or some program that's being successful, then we feel successful. But ministry is first of all about loving and building up people, and only very secondarily about what God will build as an organization, maybe as a ministry, that statistically could look successful. Be people-oriented, not task-oriented, because there are times that leaders can be slave drivers. And say, we got to get this done. we got to get this done. We, and, and what they're really saying is, you've got to get this done. You've got to get this done. Okay? And unfortunately, Jesus rebuked the spiritual leaders of his days, the Pharisees, in Matthew 23, and said, you bind heavy burdens on the people, and you don't even try to lift it with your finger. You make it hard on everyone else, and you don't even try to help them. I have known pastors and works. My daughter was part of a 
uh, part of the ministry team in a Christian school. And the director kept saying, well, finances are short. we got to sacrifice for the work of the Lord. But what he showed in practice was finances are tight. You've got to sacrifice, but me and my family, we will live like kings. <laughs> okay? And if the followers have to sacrifice, it shouldn't be unless the leader is leading the way. And joining in on the burden and the sacrifice. To just say, well, when I was young, I had to suffer, you know, to, to get going in the ministry. So you've got to suffer. Well, my family is comfortable and we go to Starbucks every, you know, other day. <laughs> no. We need to help the people forward. Loving them. If there's suffering in need, then joining in with them, but not pushing and driving them. There was a church in Singapore I heard about over 20 years ago that was a mega church, and the pastor got all of his leaders together and commanded them and said, I am commanding you, every one of you, you have to get all of your cell group leaders to double the members of the cell groups in the next six months. All the cell groups, the numbers have to double. We'll split them up. We'll double the cell groups. And if you and your team doesn't do it, you're fired. <laughs> that's what he told them. That's Singapore, okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord, that's not the Philippines, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but what happened when they're all saying, oh, we gotta work. we're already working as much as we can. Now we got to double work, you know, bricks with, uh, make bricks without straw, you know, is what Pharaoh did to the Israelites. And, and so what, these, what happened in that church was instead of trying to reach that impossible task, most of the leaders left, and by the end of six months, the church wasn't doubled, the church was half the size, because everybody split off and started their own church. And I was teaching a group of Christian leaders last week in Singapore, and I used that example. And after class one day, a lady came up to me and said, could I talk with you after class? And I said, sure. And she said, you remember that example you told about that pastor? Yes. And she said, that was my husband. <laughs> so, so I quickly tried to remember what I said. <laughs> Do I need to apologize? <laughs> you know, where, where is this leading? You know, and, and, and I had said some kind things about the man too. So, you know, <laughs> but I said, well, I, I'm sorry. You know, if, if that was any, you know, if that was difficult. She said, no, no, no. What you said is fine. That, that's, that's it. She said, but my husband, he kept pushing. He kept pushing. He ended up dying of a stroke and heart attack as a young man. And that mega church, she said, right now, we've got 100 members. And it had been many thousands. So we don't want to push and drive yourself or those under you. No have it a team that's, that's together. That yes, sometimes we sacrifice, sometimes we gotta push on, but let's build together in love, ministering together. Invest our time and our effort, not in projects and programs and getting you know, the biggest growing this or the fastest multiplying that so that we can say we're successful. Sometimes young Christian workers burn out because they're trying to prove how dedicated they are. You're so dedicated that you're doing everything else. You know, my, uh, I've kept care of all of the other vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. That's unbalanced. That's dangerous. But instead, we need to have the correct balance involved. People that we build up and minister to and train they will give us eternal fruit. But if we're only building a project that when Solomon's son became the new king, Solomon had just died. 1 Kings 14. Excuse me. No, 1 Kings 12, verse 1. And Rehoboam, that was Solomon's son, went to be, um, to be made king. And then in verse 3, uh, Jeroboam, another man, and all the Israelites came and spoke to Rehoboam, Solomon's son, saying, 
Your father made our yoke of service heavy. Therefore, lighten the service of your father and his heavy yoke he put on you, and we will serve you. That's what all the people said to their new young king. But the king decided rather than speak peaceably to the people, he said to them in verse Fourteen, he said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips. I will punish you with scorpions. And he said, My little finger is thicker, is more powerful, will weigh heavier on you than my father's leg, his thigh. I'm stronger. I'm going to rule over you with force. And what happened? Just a few days after Solomon died, Ten of the twelve tribes left the kingdom and went independent because they did not want a taskmaster, a dictator, to push them around. And five years later, we keep reading further in this same chapter. Verse 13. Uh, okay, no, excuse me. Uh, Okay, I'm not sure where it is. It's just a little bit later. It talked about how in the fifth year of Rehoboam's reign, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up with his army and would have conquered Judah, except that he instead plundered all of the gold, silver, and treasures from the kingdom. Within one year, the congregation that Solomon's son inherited was only one-sixth the size. They lost 10 out of 12 tribes, five-sixths. And within five years, they lost all of the treasure and wealth that Solomon had gathered to make the most fabulous, glorious kingdom on earth. Today, you don't read about, you know, the, the, the buried treasure of the tombs of the kings of Israel. What do you do? You see in the news and in the museums the fabulous treasures of the kings of Egypt, all the gold and everything, because they stole it from Solomon's son. And everything that Solomon worked so hard to build was gone within five years. How would you like to work hard your whole life to, to start a, a ministry of thousands of people and within a year of your passing the church on to the next leadership, it was only one-sixth the size. You lost 85% of the people. And within five years, your ministry, which was the wealthiest around, is broke and in debt. That's basically what happened to Solomon and his son because they were project-oriented. Let's build a bigger building. Let's build a bigger this. Let's do a greater something. And the burden was hard on the people. And eventually they lost the respect and to have the result of our lives and ministries remain, not just while we're in charge of a work or ministry, but also after those we train, take it onward, and even for eternity, that we will have eternal fruit. We don't just want to have praise that we're successful for a year or 20 years, and then we lose it all. No. May the Lord prepare us for more than a million years from now. We will have fruit that remains forever. That's God's calling upon our lives. But our Lord Jesus, in a note, Christ himself could have had fast results to his ministry if he was only looking for quick advancement. Back at the beginning of his ministry, two of the temptations of Satan were just... Uh, do this, you'll have a miracle. Okay? Or he said, worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. You, don't, you can have it all now. You don't have to suffer with the cross and all that. I'll give you the kingdoms now. And then later he said, just follow what I suggest. Jump off the temple and all the people will see you're the Messiah and they'll honor you. Satan was offering Jesus fast pathways to success that were not the pathway of the Father, which was the pathway of the cross. And if you're called to Christian leadership, the devil will offer you 
fast track success that will not bring fruit that remains. The first week, my family came to the Philippines back 32 years ago. We were down in Palawan where we uh, were helping leading a, a Bible school and there were no roads there, there were no towns, no doctors. And just a few days after we had moved there, one night as I was looking out across the coconut grove that we lived in, uh, there from the trail coming from the jungle, there was several hundred people that came with the leader dressed up uh, with feathers and furs and obviously, you know, the, the chief of the tribe, uh, the Palawanos, way back from the interior. And they came up and, and they came to me and the chief put a stone in my hand with many sides. And I looked at the pictures and strange inscription. And as I was looking at it, he said to me, if you will keep this, I will give you the power to heal every sick missionary you pray for. And God opened my spiritual eyes to see this was an anting anting. And this was not a natural prince. This was the principality of Satan that ruled over the tribal people in that area. And I threw that stone away, screaming no, screaming for fear that maybe there would be something in me that would want to keep it. But the fear of the Lord keeps us from evil. And yet, you might not be offered hunting on things of power, but you'll be offered if you make compromises and allow this amount of sin and, and you know, and you know, if you, you know, start to have gay contests in your church and, and you, you'll, you'll, you'll get a big congregation, okay? You know? Mr. He and He couple contest, you know? Well, you might get a lot of visitors to church, but, uh, but, God helps the church, <laughs> okay? But there are so many subtle ways that Satan would, would say, just compromise, just change the way, just do it my way, and, and you'll be fast-tracked to, to success. Jesus, by the end of his three and a half years of ministry, he looked like a failure. Looked like a failure. When he started to speak difficult things to his disciples, uh, unless you uh, drink my blood, my, fle my, uh, my blood and eat my flesh uh, and, and they couldn't understand it and they didn't stay around for the interpretation. It says in John 666, 666, okay, but you can just remember it, 666. It says at that time, most of his disciples left him. Jesus didn't preach what would multiply his followers. He preached what the Father gave him. And so we aren't just supposed to uh, preach what we think will please the people and get more people to church, you know, do things that will be attractive and compromise so more people will feel comfortable. No, we want, even if it's the slow path and even if it's the path of the cross, Jesus, although he looked like a failure, what he planted through his life and ministry has grown a harvest of hundreds of millions of Christians around the world today. And it started because no compromise, no fast track. Let's do things right. He did them right. And we are all eternally thankful. So let's learn how to not be goal-oriented, but people-oriented. Helping, loving people, building them up, patient strengthening them. Number three, we want to learn to lead by example. Don't be a signpost that says, be, you know, or Baguio, 232 kilometers. And the signpost shows you how to get a little closer to Baguio, but the signpost never gets there. <laughs> we don't want to be, this is the way to grow in God. Follow it, and you might get there, but I'm not. No, we have the example of the Apostle Paul. He said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Or King James, be imitators of me. In Philippians 3.17, join with others in following my example. And take notice of those who live according to the pattern of the godly life that Paul exemplified. 
He showed them the way, just like Christ. And so people could follow his example and have a safe pathway towards developing maturity and going on and on and on in God. Now sometimes leaders require their followers to do hard things that they won't do themselves. Well, I suffered when I was young, but now it's your turn. <laughs> Although it's rarely said quite like that. But that's how some leaders think. Okay? But for example, A, don't ask others to sacrifice money or time unless you're ready to lead the way. We studied in Nehemiah in our last seminar, I think it was the last one, that when there was great difficulty rebuilding the wall, the people were growing tired and they're saying, oh, we're in debt and we're even having to sell our sons and daughters to, to buy food. Nehemiah went and rebuked all of the Israelite businessmen that were making a profit off of selling the poor young sons and daughters of the poor people. And he said, listen, as much as we're able, we have been buying and redeeming the Israelites being sold as slaves. And now do we have to buy them from you for your profit? These things are not right. And he shamed the businessmen that were making an unjust profit off the suffering of God's people because of his example of sacrifice. And you've, if you don't remember that story, you can read it sometime in Nehemiah 5. But because of his good example, there was conviction in the hearts of the businessmen. And they said, okay, we'll forgive their debts. We'll release the slaves. We'll let Israel be a happy people of God. They lost a lot of money, but they built the people of God up and it released so many of the people to be able to wholeheartedly work and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah did it with his example, with his sacrifice in finances. He did it also in other ways. But we want to be careful and make sure that our example is leading people on. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running out all over. For with the measure you give, it will be given you in turn. So what measure do we want of financial blessing? We will get according to what we give to others. And if we are stingy, and if we make people in our team suffer, then maybe God will look at us and say, you weren't gracious, you weren't kind, you made them suffer. If you're not kind and forgiving and generous, then why should I be to you? Jesus said that about forgiveness flowing. It can be that way about giving. Give, and the measure you give will be given back to you. And my wife and I saw that some years ago when here at ZMI, we didn't have the finances in the ministry to pay all of the staff a 13th month bonus. It's a standard in the Philippines, and so it didn't come from our country, but it's standard here, so okay, okay. Here we live, here we serve, 13th month, okay. Amen? Staff, where are you, okay? Okay. All the thumbs are up. And we, we couldn't do it, there wasn't the money. And so my wife and I thought, well, we don't know how, but they need, this is proper, so we sacrifice from our own personal finances to let all of the staff have a 13th month bonus. But the very unusual thing is, we did that at the beginning of December, and then all December, we kept getting emails and news about all this extra money that was coming our way. And when I totaled it up at the end of December, this is true, we received exactly twice as much as we usually receive because we gave the double month to our staff and God gave us the double month. Okay? So do you want a double month? Yes. Well then, give your staff and your workers a 13th month bonus for Christmas. And all the Christian workers say... Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And all you pastors, 
Men of faith, women of faith, arise. Okay? Because what we give will be given to us. So if we can be generous and loving and sometimes sacrificial, God will not forget us in turn. Okay? So let's speak the word of faith, okay? <laughs> that this is scriptural and it works. Now, also, sometimes we need to encourage the church to give a sacrificial offering. Maybe someone, you know, needs hospital, a bill be paid, or, you know, there's a real difficulty in emergency, a building fund, and we really have to ask for sacrifice. If you're asking the people in the church to sacrifice, then you be the first one to pull out your only 500 peso bill, okay? And be the example leading the church on. Once in the States, my wife and I were traveling around and we were trying to raise money to support an evangelistic team that we were going to have travel through Palawan to preach the gospel. And so we're raising a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there. And then I had an invitation to go to one church that was about... Uh, 800 kilometers away and so we drove there and got a hotel for the night and the next day we went to the church it was a small church and on the midweek service seven people came and I look at them and, I, and my, my mental mind starts coning oh no we spent this much on gasoline we spent this much on you know <laughs> on the hotel we're going to come out about this much in debt probably from the average offering we would get from a little church of seven people and I'm going why did we ever come here okay. <laughs> the carnal mind okay God teaches us and hopefully brings us up so he brought me up this time by at the end of the service the pastor stood up and he was a working pastor. He was a painter. Okay? It was a small church. He didn't get very much salary from the church. So he worked a hard work week as a painter. Uh, but he stood up uh, and he said, Brothers and sisters, I believe in what Brother Norman and Sister Linda are doing in the Philippines. And, and I, think, I think we should really help them out. And he said, and, and so we should really give generously. And so as an example, you know I'm not rich. You know I work hard. But... He pulled out a hundred dollar bill and said, I'm going to be the first one to put something in the offering. Let's be generous. Let's sacrifice. And from those seven people putting money and checks in the offering plate, that was the biggest offering we got out of all the churches we traveled to. And some, you know, were churches that were big. The smallest church gave more than the big churches. And so we shouldn't despise a pastor who's a good motivator by his own example. So you want a lot in the, you know, in the building fund? Well, lead the way, <laughs> brothers and sisters. Let's be the good examples that will help in finances. Number B in your notes, lead the way in accomplishing disagreeable or even dangerous tasks. You can study again in Nehemiah 4 that when they were rebuilding the wall, it was dangerous. And Nehemiah, he stuck with it. He shared the danger with everyone else. He said, wherever we hear the trumpet blowing, there's an attack, run and we'll fight there. And then it even says, they didn't even take off their clothes day and night, except for when they washed. They wore the same stinking clothes. They put the stones on in the day. That's what they slept in at night. So if there was an enemy attack, they'd be ready to go out and fight. How many of you pastors in the building project sleep in your clothes day and night? Okay, so you can work faster. Hi, yeah, yeah. But that's what Nehemiah did. A great example of a motivator, of a man that by his own sacrificial example, he led by example. Follow me as I follow Christ. Serve the Lord like I serve the Lord. And that's challenged me so many times when we were first in Palawan, a few weeks after we were there, the house we lived at did not have a ceiling because there were many, many snakes. Once at the Bible school, they caught a python that was 21 feet long, okay, over six meters. 
And so we didn't have any ceilings because you wanted to know what was in the house with you, okay? <laughs> and so one night, we woke up in the morning, and on the rafter, the wooden beam, right above us, there was hanging a rope, a new rope. And we said, that wasn't there last night. <laughs> we pull it off. It was a snake skin. And so we took it to the main school, and all of the, of the brothers, they said, oh, oh, from the markings, oh, that's a cobra. A cobra went into your house and rubbed itself out of its old snake skin last night when you were asleep up there, and, you know, it left the snake skin. But, but don't worry, he, you know, they're tired after they shed their skin. He'll just find a corner of the house. He'll just rest for a day or two. Don't worry about him. And I go, and I'm thinking to myself, don't worry about him. He's going to hide for a day or two, and then what? <laughs> okay? And so I thought, well, we've got to get a hunting expedition. Bamboo poles, poking everywhere, and I mean, what am I going to do? Tell, tell this Bible school students, uh, you lead the way. I'll, I'll go somewhere else. I'll pray for you. <laughs> no. It wouldn't make them very, you know, bold and serious snake hunters if I was hiding. No, I had to lead the way. There was another time a church. Uh, the Muslim rebels came and surrounded the church and community for some weeks. And they were oppressing the Christians. And I, I prayed, what do we do? I felt, go. And encouraged the pastor. And we went and the pastor said, the, the rebels are all around. They're watching you. What are you doing here, Brother Norman? I said, we're here to support you and tell you, if God is for you, who can be against you? God has sent you here as a pastor. We are with you. Physically, we're with you spiritually. And strengthen and encourage him. Stand for the Lord. So, if you don't live in a Muslim area, okay. If you're in the city and there aren't too many snakes, okay. But there will be circumstances in which there will be difficult things to do. Will we lead the way? Or will we just delegate it while... We are comfortable and perhaps even unconcerned with the difficulties that others face. No, let us lead by example. Number four, seek to build your staff and followers into becoming a family. Proverbs 29, 21 says that uh, a, a servant who is uh, favored and uh, helped all from his young age, when he is old, he will become a son. We want to be those that develop a family of God, that develop people that are comfortable. And if you're a young leader and you don't feel like a mom or a dad in the spirit yet, then you be a kuya or an ate. If you're just a little older, then you still be a good example. You lead the way. And you build a family relationship of respect. Or if you're getting more mature, seek to become a spiritual father or a mother. People, a lot of times, have difficulty relating properly because of hurts from their younger years that they bring into the church and can bring into ministry teams. Jesus, when he spoke of the beginning of his ministry in Luke 4 at this first sermon he preached there. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bind the brokenhearted. And we need to minister healing to people that often have been hurt and don't trust people, don't trust leaders, if perhaps their own parents maybe even abuse them. But learn how to heal the people. And sometimes, first, our hurts have to be healed. When I was a young boy, my father was usually very negative towards me. I was the youngest child. I was the bunso, okay. And other people, my oldest sister was the valedictorian in class. My second sister was the salutatorian. You know, and when they're first and second in a class of, you know, uh, 80 people, it's pretty hard to follow in their footsteps. So he was always negative towards me. And that made it difficult for me to not be negative towards people that were under me when I was in the ministry. 
and had to cry out to God. And if I still do it some, forgive me. Okay? <laughs> but I, I've tried by God's grace. Lord, take that out of my heart. Don't let anything from the past that was wrong hinder the work of God today. Rather, let's use everything good from our past, strengthen us onward in building. Okay? I, when I was a, a young Christian, uh, had no problem relating to sisters in the Lord properly because I had three older sisters in my family that were good friends. So, but if you are a brother and you didn't have any sisters in your family, you might not know how to relate to them well. Or if you're a sister and you didn't have any brothers in your family, you might not have full social skills in knowing how to properly function. Build, learn, and do so that we can learn to become a family. I knew a pastor once that he could raise up people to a certain level in God and then he couldn't handle it anymore. He beat them down or he'd ignore them or he stopped their ministry. And, and as I tried to reach out to him and help him with some healing in his life, I found that he appreciated me, but he couldn't get close. I, I couldn't touch things in his life. And this was a man that loved other godly leaders, but he stood at a distance, stayed away. And I couldn't understand until the day came that I was conducting a seminar in a different place in the Philippines, and his father was in the hospital dying just 100 meters from where we were conducting the seminar. And eventually that brother came after his father had said for over two months, I'm just waiting for all the family to come before I die. He waited two months to visit his dad. He visited him for about a half an hour and then left. And after that, a few days later, his dad died. And I, when I saw he did not have a relationship with his natural father, then I understood how he had a difficult time having a relationship with spiritual fathers or with sons under him. But God is able to change those things. We read in Malachi chapter 4 that so that God, will, Christ in his second coming will not come in judgment. He wants to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the sons and the sons to the fathers, lest he has to come and strike the earth with a curse. God wants us to learn how to build good family relationships in the family of God. We have... The story of Samuel in the Old Testament. Samuel was a great man of God. But if you study very well, you find out from 1 Samuel chapter 8 that Samuel had two sons. He installed them to be judges when he was old and couldn't lead the country very well. But he hadn't done a good job in training them. They took bribes and they were rejected from leadership by the people of Israel. Samuel, a great leader, but he didn't train his own sons well. But consider what example did Samuel have? His, basically his adopted father that he grew up with all the years as a young boy in the tabernacle was Eli, the high priest. And Eli didn't know how to train his sons to properly follow the Lord. Eli's sons became the assistant priests but with great sin, they ended up rejected. And so Samuel didn't see that in his own spiritual father. And so he didn't learn how to build that into the next generation he had. But God was merciful to Eli in measure. Eli did get a second chance in training Samuel how to hear the voice of God. When his own sons failed, God gave him later another spiritual son that he was able to train. So God gave him a second chance later and he still had good fruit in Samuel. You study about Samuel, his children, they, it doesn't say they were sons of the devil, uh, but they weren't good, good believers. They took bribes, so they couldn't be leaders, although they were probably better sons than Eli's sons. But the Bible does say that Samuel's oldest son uh, named Joel had a son named Heman, and Heman became one of the great prophets in David's kingdom. 
And from Heman came 16 song leaders, worship leaders, and ministers. So, so with the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, Samuel ended up with training and helping the next generation as well. But the same fault in his spiritual father was also a weakness in his ministry. His own next generation, he did not train well. And so we want to gain all the strength we can from the good things we've learned in our natural family and growing up. But if there's weaknesses, or if there's weaknesses in our spiritual family, or in someone that mentored you to become a Christian leader, then let's, by God's grace, overcome those weaknesses. Let's let God be the healer of our heart so we, in turn, can be the healer of others so that we will be able to build strong families that are stable, solid, going on with God. So make sure that you're praying. If you're a leader of, of a group, that you're praying with them. Make sure they're doing good. Have meetings together. Even have fun times together. Pastors should take the church workers and staff out sometimes maybe for a meal. Or if you're too poor, then go out for a barbecue, okay? If you're too poor for that, then, you know, go out and have fun with banana cubes, okay? <laughs> but go out and have fun and be, be a family and do something together. Play games. We hope we haven't imparted too much. Don't just say, by next Friday, I want this report, and there's got to be 50% increase, and, you know. No, let's build love. Let's build together. And so it's important. Let's build the family of God. And lastly, number five, if we are going to be servant leaders, building up and strengthening those who follow us, we need to keep getting closer and closer to God so that we have more to impart and teach and lead our followers into. Only as we keep going on with God can people keep following us. Many times people can receive a measure from your ministry and then they have to go move on somewhere else because you can't lead them any farther. But if we're always growing, we can always lead the people to a next step as long as we stay ahead of them. As long as you're always studying, you'll always have new things to teach. As long as you're meeting the Lord in new ways, you'll have new revelations, new anointings, new blessings to give to your followers. And so things that we can pass on if we first receive them from God is number A, godly character. In John 17, 19, Jesus said, well, let's read it to get the exact words. This was in the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus near the end of his ministry. And as he's praying for his disciples, he said in John 17 and verse 19, said, for their sakes, He's praying about his disciples. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. If we sanctify ourselves, we can impart it into our followers. We can build godly character, the greatest treasure, more than just gifts or talents or skills, a godly life we can build it into our followers if we have it ourselves. Last week I was at a Christian bookstore in Singapore and a woman looked at me and, and looked with shock. And I'm looking at her, what's wrong? <laughs> Is my hair not combed right? I didn't know. Why is she staring at me? And she looked at me and she said, I see the holiness of Brian Bailey in you. And I could only say, thank you, God. And to her say, may the Father be glorified in his sons. Jesus wanted his Father glorified in him. And may we impart to our sons and daughters that which will also honor you. And so 
Praise the Lord. Dad? Yeah. If, you're, if you can listen up there, okay? <laughs> Your sons are going on, and you are being honored on the earth. Okay? We find a warning for us in the Old Testament in the life of King Solomon in your notes. King Solomon spent seven years building his temple, the house of God, but then he spent much longer building his own house, his own palace, 13 years. So that was the consecration in his life. Okay? Seven parts for God, 13 parts for me. So out of 20, he got 13, he got it. 65% uh, of my life, I will live for me, and 35%, I'll build the house of God. But you also find, when he spent seven years focusing on building God's house, and 13 years selfishly building a glorious palace, the next 20 kings, the rest of the kings and his kingdom after him, he had 20 years building the house of God and his house, 20 kings after him, there were seven good kings after him and, seven, and 13 selfish, evil kings. The same mixture in his life. Seven parts for God, 13 parts for me, became what was imparted into the kings that followed him. Seven followed God, 13 followed sin and self. And so we need to be aware of the power of a godly life and warned of the danger of a life of mixture. There was a study done 150 years after the death of a godly pastor named Jonathan Edwards of his descendants. And out of his children and children's children, great-grandchildren, 150 years later, the results were this godly pastor and his descendants had one vice president of the United States, Three national senators, three state governors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 university professors, 100 lawyers, and 100 missionaries became the godly fruit of the descendants of this godly pastor, Jonathan Edwards. But he had a contemporary that lived and died at the same time as him, and this man was not a godly pastor, he was an atheist named Max Jukes. And 150 years later, they made a list of all of the fruit of his descendants. Seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 prostitutes, 130 convicts, 310 paupers that the, the government spent millions to support, 400 descendants whose health became impaired because of their being alcoholics or immortal or, immortal, or they were brawlers, fighters, and and they cost millions to society, whereas the godly pastor's descendants contributed millions of dollars to the betterment of society. The power of a godly life and the warning of what mixture or ungodliness can multiply. Even in someone who looked successful like Solomon. My spiritual father, Brian Bailey, once prophesied, over a young pastor and said, God is going to multiply the fruit of your ministry greatly. God will do that. But depending upon what you do with your life, the fruit, the great multiplied fruit you have is either going to be sweet, nutritious apples or you're going to multiply crab apples. And you don't have crab apples in the Philippines, but it's a little sour apple, very bitter you, if, you, if you're starving, you will eat it, okay? But only if you're starving, okay? You'll, you'll go for the good apples all the time. Well, he prophesied that 30 plus years ago. That church has grown up to be more than 5 million people. Or, excuse me, 5,000 people. And some of you would even know the name of the church, famous among nations. But it's a church full of immorality and corruption. They've grown a lot of crab apples okay when God says he's going to multiply your ministry make sure there's only good in your life that when he multiplies all your fruits going to be good 
you don't want them multiplying. Seven murderers, 60 con convicts, 50 prostitutes, 310 jailbirds, and <laughs> everything else that might be the multiplied mixture of our hearts. No. Godly character is the greatest thing we can pass on to those who can follow in our footsteps. And number B, also prophecies and guidance from God. Hear from God for your followers. Have wise counsel. Maybe get a scripture or a prophecy. 1 Timothy 1.18. Paul said to Timothy, uh, you can wage a good warfare by the prophecies that have gone on before you. Paul prophesied over Timothy and gave him guidance for the future, for his future struggles and Christian warfare. And through it, Timothy became a very successful pastor. So we want to be able to give wise counsel and guidance or prophecies to those who go after us. Just last week, I was over in Singapore, and one of our Singaporean graduates said, Brother Norman, do you remember the prophecy you gave me at graduation? I said, no. I don't remember any of that, you know. She said, well, well I, re I remembered. I wrote it down, and, and right now, I've checked off the things over the years. She's been graduated over 12 years. She said, most of it's checked off, but right now, I'm right in the middle of this part of the prophecy. I said, well, praise the Lord. Good, then. If it's God, then follow it. It's, it's for you. It's a strength to lead her on in her growing ministry. But if we have something to give to our followers... It will lead them on with strength and success. And number C, anointings and giftings of the Holy Spirit. We can read in Deuteronomy 39, 34 verse 9, that Joshua had received the spirit of wisdom after Moses prayed for him because Moses had laid his hands on him, inaugurated him as the next leader of Israel, and imparted to him the anointing of the spirit of of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom was strong in the life of the spiritual father of Pastor David Wallace and myself, of Brian Bailey. He once met Catherine Kuhlman, a very famous, mighty anointed evangelist, miracle worker. But when she prayed for him, she didn't pray for miracles or for healing. He didn't need healing. She just touched him and said, wisdom. And he was slain in the spirit with a deeper anointing of the spirit of wisdom. And he had that anointing upon his life that he passed on to others. He was very elderly and couldn't come to the inauguration of this building. But he sent a video and he said he was praying. And he said and he felt that God showed him that the spirit of wisdom would be proclaimed through this property, through the buildings, through the, the landscaping. The spirit of wisdom would be proclaimed. And that God can build us up in wisdom for building projects, for building our lives in so many different ways. He can, we can have imparted anointings to us. Once, I was going to travel to a new nation I had never been at, and I asked Pastor Bailey, I was visiting him at the time, please pray for me, I'm going to a new nation to teach a Bible school of 200 people. He said, I'll be praying for you. Well, the first day I preached, the teaching was okay, but it was dry. And so I'm saying, Lord, help me, you know. I need, the, I need the anointing. That that night, in a dream, Pastor Bailey came up and laid hands on me and filled me with a new anointing. And I woke up feeling the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In a dream? He's thousands of kilometers away? But his prayers and his anointing came to me. You read in the New Testament, Paul, in the Spirit, went and saw how the Colossian church was doing well. He said to the Corinthians, I'll be absent in the flesh, but I'll be present in spirit, and this is what you have to do to correct the sin in your church. I'll be with you in spirit. So Pastor Bailey came and anointed me, and the rest of the week was so good that at the end of the school year, they had a vote of who was your favorite teacher, and they picked me. But <laughs> the reason they picked me was if, if I hadn't got that fresh anointing, I would have never won the vote, okay? But it was the fresh anointing of Pastor Bailey flowing through me that blessed those people. And so we want to receive from anointed servants of God. And as you get older, you'll find your spiritual moms and dads start dying, okay? And after a while, 
you start to be the only ones left. You're getting to be the old guys on the block, okay? And you can't get the anointing from them anymore. You're the ones that are responsible in God that you pass it on to the next generation. So if you're still young, get everything you can from the older ones, okay? But your time is short, okay? Get everything you can and give everything that you can. Because in that way, God will multiply his blessings, his gifts, his anointings upon the people of God. So in conclusion, if we want to become the best of leaders, we need to become the best of servants. Give, bless, anoint, pray for them, be friends with them, love them. Be a kuyo or an ate, or if you're older, become a mom or a dad. Strengthen the people under you. Be patient and kind, but if you are walking in righteousness, if you aren't compromising, if you're walking the path of the cross, it might be slow maturity, slow success, but it's going to be fruit that remains. And it can go on even beyond your life or beyond what you've given to a church. So that years after you go to a different ministry or you go to be with the Lord, that fruit can multiply. Abraham got the whole promised land. Not through his own personal works, but through with what he imparted into the coming generations. And there's going to be a victorious, glorious church that we need to prepare for quick in the few years we have before the return of the Lord. Let's do all we can to build up and you build many leaders in turn that will be able to train many more in turn and see how many multiplied rewards and eternal fruit you will have in God's kingdom. Amen. Serve the best and you will be promoted the greatest. Let's stand and let's pray. Let's all pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Let's everyone just lift up our voice. Let's all pray. Thank you, Lord God. Yes, Lord Jesus. Wonderful God. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord.